Anyone who repents and believes in Christ will be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. This is Tony Broom Ministries. Welcome to the following teaching session from the book of Acts. The title is The Conversion of Saul. We know Saul as Paul. Saul of Tarsus became Paul, the mighty apostle. We will study his conversion from the book of Acts. Our golden text is 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. A grand statement this is indeed. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, to be accepted by all that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is the chief reason for His coming. That is the major reason that Christ came into the world. He came to heal. He came to bless. He came to comfort. He came to make a way and all that. But the main reason He came was to save sinners. He even said Himself, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And Paul says here, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he said, Of whom I am chief. He felt like he was the chiefest of sinners. Not at that time. He was not a sinner anymore. He was a Christian, of course, and an apostle. But he said, I am chief. He realized that he had been the chiefest among sinners. And Christ could save someone like Saul of Tarsus. He could save anyone. We say that sometimes about ourselves. If Christ can save me, He can save anybody. Saul was a persecutor of Christians. Saul of Tarsus kept the raiment of those who slew Stephen, the first Christian martyr. He gave his voice against him, consenting unto his death. This started an all-out persecution and threat against Christians. This resulted in the church being scattered. And the book of Acts talks about the scattering upon the persecution about Stephen. And they were scattered, but they went everywhere preaching the word. Even though the church was scattered, they were not all together in Jerusalem anymore. And the devil succeeded, if you want to say that, in scattering them. But, what he didn't know, I don't know if he knew it or not, I don't care whether he knew it or not, but the thing is, when they were scattered, wherever they went, they preached the word. Acts chapter 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, and that's what they described the Christian way as many times in the Bible it is described as the way or this way. If he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound into Jerusalem. So he had a plan. And he went in the zeal of his youth, in the power of his zeal against the body of Christ, against Christians to have them thrown in prison, to have them killed, whatever he could do to try what he thought was serving God. And actually, he was against God. There are several times during the book of Acts that he relates his testimony. One is in chapter 22, verse 4. And when he was giving his testimony, different parts of it comes out. And it goes all together to make a splendid testimony for the Lord. And I persecuted this way, there he is calling it again, this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Verse 19 and 20. And I said, Lord, they know that I imprisoned and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. So this brings out different parts of the testimony. He had the Christians beaten. 
He had them thrown in jail. He had them delivered to be persecuted. And he compelled them, as he says to King Agrippa in chapter 26, verse 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. And so we see his vehement railing and anger against Christians. And he persecuted them with all his might. And he tells in different parts of the book of Acts, putting the testimony all together, you can see how he threatened them. In the beginning, it says he threatened them and then it comes down to where he beat them and he hailed men and women and threw them in prison, compelled them to blaspheme, gave his voice against them when they died. And now he is apprehended by Christ. Jesus arrested him, if you will, on the road to Damascus, chapter 9, verse 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Me? Who is me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, Jesus said, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Yet, Paul was not persecuting him personally. That is, Jesus was not there in front of him. He was not beating Jesus. He was not kicking Jesus. But he was by doing it to his children. Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have done it or have not done it unto the least of these, my brothers, you have done it or not done it to me. The way that we treat God's people is the way that we treat Christ personally. So this was a personal persecution. Jesus said, you are persecuting me. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Saul knew that there was something in his life unsatisfied. And yet he went after this thing as hard as he could go. Now, on a mission to persecute the Christians in Damascus, he comes face to face with the light and the glory of God. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Saul was blinded by the light of God's glory. He remains three days without sight. During the time that he did, it was a struggle. His life, all his life had been in the law and in the pharisaical and Judaism religion. And now he comes face to face with Christ and his life changes. But it's a struggle not to be saved. He was saved in a moment, in an instant. But all the things that he had been through in his life, all the things that he had learned, now he's found a new way of life. And it is a drastic, it is a dramatic change in his life. And he goes through this three days. In some ways it was joyous and glorious. And he prays and he sees visions and all these things happen. But in another way, it is traumatizing. It is agonizing to him to have this soul and heart-wrenching thing going on in his life. Three days of torture and yet realization that he's coming face to face with God and his life has been changed. In the meantime, God speaks to Ananias, one of his disciples in Damascus, telling him to go to Saul and pray for him. And Ananias says, wait a minute, Lord, I hate to question you, but I've heard many about this man. 
and here that he persecutes Christians everywhere. And even here he has authority from the chief priests to persecute any who call on your name in this city. And the Lord assures him to go his way. He said, For I have chosen him as a special vessel to me. In verse 17, Acts chapter 9, of course, Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul. <laughs> How wonderful it is to hear that expression the first time. Do you remember the first time that you heard yourself called as brother or sister, so-and-so, whatever your name is, and here he is called Brother Saul. He was always Saul the persecutor, Saul the mean man, Saul of Tarsus. Now it's Brother Saul. Brother Saul, who we know as Brother Paul. Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. What a wonderful time it is. Every one of us, brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter whether you're the greatest apostle who ever lived, of course that's Christ, but other than him, or whether you're a pauper, whether you're a servant, sitting behind the meal as the Bible calls it, whether you're the high or the low or anybody in between, all of us have to come the same way. We may not have the same circumstances around us. Some of us are saved in a palace. Some of us are saved on a mill hill or in the country or out in the field, in the church, by your bedside, whatever it is. Those things may differ, but all of us have to come the same way. We all have to be born again. We all have to have a sanctified heart in life. We all have to have the same experience, the baptism and fullness of the Holy Ghost. Brother Saul, the Lord, sent me to pray for you. And that took some faith on this Ananias disciple's part to believe what God said because he had a strong opposition. He had a strong reason to doubt and to say this man is not really real and in fact, he told the Lord that. But God reassured him. And he had to step out in faith to be able to go and to know it's real. Is he bluffing us off? Does he really mean it? Is he just trying to trick us? Then when he gets us on his side, then he kills us. Well, it was real. And Saul had really gotten saved. And now Ananias goes to him. And he puts his hands on him. Brother Saul... The Lord sent me to pray for you to receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Now he's baptized in water. Now he's identified himself with Christ. And he's transformed by Christ, by the power of God, a transformation in the life. Jesus said, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject unto you. That's a great thing to know that all powers of hell have to bow and have to obey in the name of Jesus. But he said, don't rejoice in that. Rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. The fact that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life is greater than anything else in this whole world. And now... The same thing that happens to Paul happens to every one of us. We're transformed by the power of Christ. Verse 20, straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent? He came here to do the same thing that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ, or that this is indeed the Christ. Now there's no doubt. And he's preaching, as he said in Galatians chapter 2, he preached the faith that he once destroyed, that is, 
the end of Galatians chapter 1 says it too, that he preached the faith now that he used to destroy. A wonderful thing. And it happens to every one of us. We used to be against God. We used to be against the preacher. We used to be against church. We didn't like church. We didn't want to go to church. We didn't have use for the Bible. We didn't read the Bible. We didn't go by the Bible. And now all that has changed. Now we read the Bible. We love to hear the Bible. We love the preacher. We love the church. We love the people of God. We love God. We love the things of God. Verse 26. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Now he comes to Jerusalem after preaching in Damascus. And he tries to join up with the apostles and with the disciples. But they said, no, sir, he's bluffing us off. He's trying to trick us. And when we are befriended by him, then he'll kill us, rise up against us. They didn't believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Here old Barnabas, that son of consolation, the one that sold his land in the beginning and gave the price to the apostles. Now he's a faithful believer. And now he takes this new Christian, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, and he brings him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. Oh, what a wonderful thing. He's found this new life in Jesus Christ and he's now... He used to be with those, the bad boy company. And now he's in company and fellowship with the people of God, coming in and going out with them at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. So now he's one of the believers. It doesn't matter who you are. When you stand up for God, those who are against God, they'll take you out or try to just like they will anybody else. It doesn't matter what your name is. You're not going to get any clout with this world just because of who you are, what your name is, because once you cash in your hat, if you will, once you throw it in all with the Lord Jesus, you lose your identity. You may still have a name. You may still live in a house. You may still own some property or have a car, but you lose yourself. You lose your identity in Jesus Christ. So here is Saul. Now he preaches, and they try to kill him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. Now he goes back home for a while. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Now the churches, that persecutor, that problem, they had always been a threat. They always had to look out and watch out. Be careful. And now the persecutor has gotten right with God. And the churches had rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. And they were edified, they were built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. When you're in, involved in a fight, and I mean not a fight like a physical fight, but the Christian life is warfare. And there are times when you're fighting against the forces of evil, and you're fighting against the things of darkness. And that takes place throughout our Christian life. But as long as you're involved in that conflict, it's hard to extend the gospel like you want to. It's hard to be multiplied when you're involved so much in this fight that's going on. But when you're able to rest in the Holy Ghost, when you're able to rest and have the Spirit of God to rest upon you, and you can take time not just to fight and to hide and to try to worship and yet not be found out and you're trying to dodge persecution and trying to keep from being killed and all these things that you have to go through when you can rest in the lord 
when that thread is taken away and that burden is lifted up from off of your life and your shoulders. You have an opportunity to be edified in your faith and you have to be built up and it allows you to be multiplied and disciples will come to the Lord. The Lord realizes this. There are times when He wants us to fight and that armor of God that we always have to have on, of course, and we have to fight against the forces of evil. But there are times, yeah, we're still fighting, but that's not our main thrust. That's not our main thing. Sometimes we're able to rest. We have to have rest in the Lord, not rest from the Lord, but rest in the Lord. And as we rest in the Lord, we're able to be edified. We're able to be taught. We're able to be lifted up. And this is one thing that we have to pray about in the hour that we live in now. When there's so much disease, there's so much discord, and there's so much dissatisfaction in this world, in the secular part of the world, and also many times in the parts of the church. But the church of Jesus Christ is alive and well. And God realizes that we need to be, as He did the disciples, they would be out there involved in healing and delivering from demons and they would follow Christ around and He would teach and preach. Then sometimes He would draw them aside. In fact, one time He said, Come aside yourselves apart and rest a while. Can't rest forever, but sometimes we have to rest a while. And sometimes we need to be multiplied. We have to be taught so that we can grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Saul was converted, and he is Paul, one of the greatest apostles who ever lived. He wrote most of the New Testament, and God used him mightily to bring the gospel outreach. Peter is the one who opened the door of faith to the Gentiles and was used by God to do that, but Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles. Many people were reached for the Lord through His life. Have you made Jesus Christ your Savior and Lord today? You have an opportunity now to receive Christ as your Savior and make Him your Lord. If you have not done so, you need to do so right now today. While you still have the opportunity, do it right now. Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins. I open my heart to you and receive you as my Savior and make you my Lord. I know that right now, on the authority of your word, that I am saved and I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. The Conversion of Saul has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.